Almost a year on after releasing their full first color images, ESA's Euclid Space Telescope has just released this gargantuan mosaic of the sky. This 208 gigapixel image comprises just 1% of the sky of what Euclid plans to cover. And all of this observation took just two weeks to take. Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Liu, and in this video, let's talk about Euclid and its incredible release. So this week I've been busy, I've been away in this beautiful town of Maintenon, just outside of Paris, and this is where King Louis XIV hid away his mistress, the Marquise of Maintenon. But it wasn't for a getaway, it wasn't for a holiday. I was actually at a meeting discussing one of Euclid's deep fields. You see, Euclid will carry out two types of surveys. The wide survey will cover about 15,000 square degree of the extra galactic sky. This is the main survey of the mission. It avoids the galactic plane, which is the disk of our galaxy, the Milky Way, where there are just too many stars. Remember, Euclid is interested in galaxies and too many bright stars in the view would overwhelm Euclid's images, making it difficult to distinguish the faint distant galaxies that are the mission's primary target. It also avoids the ecliptic plane. Now this is the plane of our solar system and where zodiacal light is high. Zodiacal light is a faint glow caused by sunlight reflecting off dust particles left over from the formation of our solar system. And whilst it may be pretty to look at, zodiacal light creates unwanted background noise in Euclid's images, making it harder to detect faint galaxies. Kind of like light pollution here in a city, it makes it harder to see those faint stars in the night sky. But in addition to the wide survey, Euclid will also target three deep fields, totaling about 50 square degrees. The EDF North Field is centered around the northern ecliptic pole, the EDF South Field, and the EDF Fornax region. In these regions, the observations will be much deeper, much longer exposures, so that the signal to noise of the galaxies will be two magnitudes better than in the wider survey. This can then be used to calibrate the observations on the main survey, but for sure there'll be loads of other interesting things to see too, like rare astronomical objects. Euclid will revisit these deep fields multiple times throughout its mission, gradually building up on the deep images. Now, during my meeting, we were preparing for the science in the Euclid Fornax deep field, where we're currently also observing with deep XMM Newton observations, so X-ray emission. Now, X-ray emission is a signature of extremely energetic processes. This allows us to identify and study objects like active galactic nuclei, also known as AGN, where supermassive black holes are actively accreting matter, feeding on the matter around them, and then also clusters of galaxies where hot gas emits X-rays. By combining the X-ray data from XMM Newton with Euclid's optical and infrared observations, we'll gain multi-wavelength perspectives on these objects and their environment. Now at the meeting, I also got the pleasure of meeting Jean-Charles Coulange, the mastermind behind the Euclid image releases, and I'm kind of kicking myself because we didn't get a picture together. But one really interesting thing I did talk to him about was the standardization of Euclid images. Euclid's press release images have a very distinctive color palette, and there's a very deliberate reason for it. It's not just about aesthetics. It's about conveying scientific information very clearly, distinguishing Euclid's data from other telescopes like Hubble and JWST. When you see a Euclid image, they want you to immediately know it's Euclid. Euclid has two main instruments, VIS, which observes in visible light, and NISP, which sees in near-infrared light, but it has three different filters, Y, J, H. These are looking at different wavelengths. So this means that we have four different wavelengths in total of the observations, but we can only view images in three different channels, RGB. In generating the images for the press, they don't use all the filters, they use the VIS, the Y-band and the H-band images for the RGB color channels, the red, green, blue color channels. 
but in principle they could use any of them in any order and with different weightings. In Euclid's distinctive colour palette, hot stars have a white blue hue and this is because hot stars will emit most of their light in blue and ultraviolet parts of the spectrum. Euclid's Viz instrument captures this light and it's assigned a white blue colour in the final image. This helps it to pick out young massive stars and star forming regions. In the Euclid images, excited gas manifests itself in blue, but hydrogen gas actually emits a characteristic red light known as H alpha emission when it's energized by nearby hot stars. In reality, then, it should be red, and it might seem counterintuitive, but this was a deliberate choice to make these regions stand out and differentiate them from other red features in the image. Now lastly, dust absorbs and scatters blue light more than red, and this means that regions that are rich in dust will appear redder. Molecular gas is often also associated with dust, so these regions will also tend to have a red hue in Euclid's images, as well as distant redshifted background galaxies. Okay, so now you know all that you're looking at, let's dive into the image. Euclid will be making the largest 3D map of the universe over the course of its six years. And this image is just 1% of the whole wider survey, consisting of a mosaic of 260 observations taken in just two weeks. Euclid covers two and a half times the moon's area in just one image. So this mosaic is 500 times larger than the area of the moon as seen from Earth. It's insanely big. This is what the same field looks like from a ground-based telescope in the DSS-9 survey. In this image, there are also three black patches that have intentionally been avoided due to the presence of bright stars that can saturate its detectors. This saturation would create unwanted artifacts and streaks in the image, making it difficult to analyze the surrounding areas, but it can also damage the sensitive detectors, reducing their lifespan. The light can bleed into neighboring pixels and leave an afterglow visible in subsequent images, an effect known as persistence. Now, we've seen the six prominent spike patterns of stars in previous images due to light diffraction within the telescope. But one of the most striking features in this particular mosaic is probably the intricate network of faint wispy clouds scattered among the stars of our own Milky Way galaxy. These delicate structures, known as galactic cirrus, appear like a subtle blue haze. They're composed of gas and dust, and they resemble the wispy cirrus clouds we see in Earth's atmosphere, hence their name. Euclid's remarkable sensitivity allows its visible light camera to capture these faint clouds, which are illuminated not by their own light, but instead by reflecting the glow of countless stars within the Milky Way. And actually, they're even brighter in far infrared and submillimeter telescopes, so like images from like Planck. Now, zooming into the images, we see just how saturated this mosaic is with stars. Each of those white specks are actually galaxies, and this becomes more evident when we actually zoom in even further. This is 150 times zoomed in to the large mosaic, showing two galaxies, ESO 364-GO35 and GO36, interacting with each other. On the right is the galaxy cluster Abel 3381, and this is what it would look like from the ground with DSS-9, completely incomparable. Now, Hubble and JWST have captured our imaginations with their deep high resolution views of the universe. But they also face a massive limitation. They have tiny fields of view. They only see a tiny fraction of the sky at a time. And although Euclid's resolution is just half that of Hubble, it would take Hubble five years to make the same mosaic as we see here. That took Euclid just two weeks. Even with JWST, you would still need almost half a year to make the same observations. And for the cosmology science that Euclid will do, looking for dark energy and dark matter, we really need to be looking at things at massive scales. 
But it's not all about pretty pictures. Euclid will be processing more than 170 petabytes of data over the six years of its lifetime. So far, just 12% of the mission is complete, but it won't be until 2026 until we get the first cosmology data and results. Anyway, I hope you liked the mosaic. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share, and subscribe.